Welcome to the first edition of Anglican Unscriptive of 2019, episode 468. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton, and it's January the 1st. Okay, welcome to a program that we're going to have fun with. Uh, guys, I hope you had a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year. George, you moved your house. You, you, you're in a new location. Yes, our, uh, we began moving the day after Christmas and finished last night about 10 o'clock in the evening. Meanwhile, it's the busiest pastoral time of the year because I have to see everybody who's sick and shut in. And, mm -hmm. and so my poor wife uh, has got a piano on her back going up three flights of stairs and everything. No, not quite. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> so if I'm a little slow or punchy, it's because I'm not uh, quite here. And Gavin, how are you doing today? Um, well, I haven't moved house, so I'm feeling very privileged. Yeah, I, I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still getting over my cold, but I haven't moved house either. I mean, last time I moved was three years ago, and I, at that point, Jill and I sat down and said, our next move is the nursing home. We, we just can't handle it. At our age, moving is not something we like to do at all. Um, let's move on to the news. Um, we just had a long, hour-long pre-show because we wanted to make this episode special and talk about you know make it really a, a must listen to must watch episode and we kind of want to help uh with anglicanism anglicanism in 2019 what does it look like how is it defined is it undefined is it a tale of two churches uh two anglicanisms and this is a great time to sit down and talk about it because there's a dichotomy about what's happening with the GAFCON people and with the Church of England and with uh, Anglicanism around the world. Some of it is strong and growing. Some is weak and dying. And it's a great time to, to really talk about that. Um, let's start with you, George. Tale of two churches. Kevin, I think there are thousands of churches. Um, Anglicanism, I don't know what that means anymore, to be perfectly frank. Uh, doesn't mean to be in fellowship with Canterbury. Doesn't mean uh, that you're a particular member of a certain trade union. Uh, doesn't mean that you follow the prayer book. I'm not quite sure what it means. Um, maybe it's some sort of genetic abnormality. <laughs> but Kevin, there are as many Anglicanisms right now as it seems to be churches or people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some are doing very, very well. I, in our conversation, we just had an hour long conversation. I just get struck time and again, time and again, how fortunate I am being in a little o oasis of Christendom in north central Florida compared to Connecticut, compared to England, compared to China. The Lord has blessed us here, and I'm just so grateful. And Gavin, you see it differently. After your introduction, I want to say it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> Charles Dickens. <laughs> if, we, if, we, if, we're doing, if we're doing a tale of two cities and two sure. churches. Um, I think to be Anglican is, to, first of all, to be part of the one holy Catholic apostolic church. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? One, it means we grow together in unity and obedience to our Lord. Uh, holy, we, we remember that, that Israel was made to be holy and that if we're not holy, we're not, we're not anything. Catholic, because there's been a universal expression of Christianity, the same in all places at all times. And if we're not doing that, there's something wrong with us. And apostolic, because we have to be rooted into the early church as it flourished. What's Anglican's virtue? Anglicanism is a renewal movement. And when the Catholic Church needed renewal in the 16th century, Anglicanism said, we're going to do this by staying as close as possible, but asking the Holy Spirit to help us clean the church up so that we're as close to the New Testament as we can be in terms of spirit. My very powerful sense is there's a new reformation uh, or there's a need for a new reformation. And therefore to be Anglican is to be open to the Holy Spirit and to be faithful to reforming the church. What's the reformation about? Well, interestingly enough, again, it seems to me to be about where the church submits to the spirit of the age, the Holy Spirit calls it back to its roots to be faithful. The spirit of the age today appears to be a globalizing, progressive, secular identity politics movement, which is takes great offense at the Christian revelation. To be faithfully Anglican is to stand against that movement and to keep the church pure.
pure in the best sense, in the sense not of being better, but of being faithful. So that's that's the task. But Anglicanism itself is splitting into two. Uh, just just as, as Israel did in the period of the New Testament. There are those who I would call quislings who want an accommodation with the powers that be in order that they be le they, they're left alone and not be disturbed. And there are others who want a more energetic way of being faithful because they think if you accommodate, then you disappear. Okay, uh, well, uh, let me interrupt here because you defined pure Anglicanism, the Reformation of Anglicanism, uh, yet I can post a picture in our last episode of two men getting married under a female bishop in the Diocese of Niagara, and Canada will call that Anglican. Church of England isn't going to dispute that that's England. I don't see Justin Welby's, Welby saying that's not Anglican. Um, this is the, the, the period of time where, we, where Anglicanism is having trouble with its definition. Well, go on, George. I... Um... As an aside, uh, the Church of England would have no problem with this. We all remember the Dean of Montreal, Anglican Church of Canada, married gay man, not just partnered, but married, moved to the UK with his partner and now is serving and licensed in the Diocese of Chelmsford. Uh, you have married gay clergy in the Church of England opening above board and with a full and certain knowledge of their bishops. Um, well, and that's why that's why yesterday I was so pleased when Kevin put the picture up because one of the things that picture does for us is to say this is a picture of the church. Uh, if you do nothing else, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get women bishops marrying homosexual male clergy to each other, where usually one of them, if, if the pattern is kept, isn't even a believer. So that's where we're going. And the question is, is that Christianity? And and is that what you know? Is is that being obedient to the God we're called to serve? And my answer is no, it isn't. I, I want to uh, jump on what Gavin said because I agree with him in all of the essentials that he said, but my experience has been that that's just not true. In other words, all of the things of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, yes, I view my parish as Christendom, if you will, where uh, if you speak English and you're a Protestant, you come here. And again, also, I have my experience. I can remember in 1998 having very long conversations with a lovely man named Gene Robinson, who uh, I met at the General Convention. He later became bishop in 2003 of New Hampshire. And uh, we were polite, amicable, but we disagree completely. And one of the things Gene Robinson would say in our conversations is, my God. Well, my God would think this, and my God would do mm -hmm. that. And I came away very clearly that though we're a member of the same trade union, we both, you know, uh, worship the mammon uh, from 815s uh, in New York City, we don't have a common God. We don't have a one, we don't have a holy, we don't have a Catholic, we don't have an apostolic mm -hmm. church. We think we do, but my experience has been that it's never been true in my lifetime. So not only is Anglicanism undefined, God is undefined. Well, there's um, no, Gene's well, God and there's see. my God. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. But, but, wait. Gavin, but Gavin, I, I think, and then I, where I would take issue with you, says there are two, you would talk about the two churches. Well, and you gave the example of the, the woman bishop and the, uh, the, the now married suffragan bishop of Toronto and the good people. Where I'm discouraged and where I look at Gafcon and where I fall down is that it then further divides. We have groups that, uh, oppose GAFCON on the women's issue. And then we have uh, these people say we have to have seven ecumenical councils, not five. Um, at what point do we stop these splits uh, and just... Well, the, I suppose the answer is... Do, you, do I agree? Everybody's okay, or unless you think as, as uniquely as I do, you're not okay. Well, George, the, I think what, what, what you've done is you've, prevent, you've presented uh, one holy Catholic and apostolic uh, as if you either score 100%, in which case you've succeeded, or you haven't and they don't exist. I well, think we've, of course, succeeded here, so I think, I, I, I think uh, you're, so, you're being exactly right. But, I mean, I think if, if you are a faithful Christian, that's the mindset in which you operate. 
So each, each one of these, if you like, are aspirations that we're called to do better with. We're called to better unity, uh, more Catholicity, um, more apostolicity. Um, and so the fact that we don't score 10 out of 10 doesn't mean we give up and say, this is a complete mess, it's never existed. It's a calling of the Holy Spirit to get closer to the source, to do, to do to as better as we can. The problem is, I think, that if you go too far away from them, you put yourself under the magnetic pull of a different force, a different spirit. And that's exactly what I think happens to the church. The reason why uh, in my dualistic world there are two churches is because one has been pulled so far away from the values of the one holy Catholic apostolic church that it has entered the sphere of another agency, another, another dominating world view. And, that's what I think has happened to Anglicanism. Interestingly enough, it's happening to the Roman Catholics. It's not enough to be a Roman Catholic. Uh, this is a period of two popes, Pope Francis and Pope Benedict. They stand for uh, a similar kind of bifurcation of the one we're talking about. There are many Catholics who are anxious that Pope Francis is buying into the progressive value system we've talked about, uh, and that Benedict doesn't. They're worried about the Catholic Church splitting uh, along the grounds of the same dynamic we've been talking about. What is the answer? To give up and say we always split, we can't help it, or to get as close to New Testament apostolicity as we as we possibly can? I think the latter. So who is the enemy, Gavin? Is it uh, well-meaning but ineffectual bishops, or is it Satan who is destroying the church? Uh, well, <laughs> I would say they go <laughs> hand in hand. <laughs> I think theologically, of, the theologically, of course, it's Satan. Interestingly enough, um, I was practically, reading uh, it's practically say it's not the, just theologically it's practically but I, I interrupt your point I'm sorry I, I well I was reading about C.S. Lewis in the last couple of days uh, I've always felt slightly guilty about being dualistic because you know it's one of the favorite insults that Anglicans throw at each other you can be anything you like but if you're dualistic you're beyond the pale and, and Lewis, Lewis was. Kevin, happy. have you ever been called dualistic? I've <laughs> never been thrown at me. Uh, Gavin, you're in a much more rarefied atmosphere. But mm -hmm. go, go. Uh, and so, um, C.S. Lewis said, "You you can come as close as dualism to dualism as you like in ethics. In other words, there are two two different ways, but you can't be dualistic." Uh, um, I think it was either ontologically or metaphysically. So in other words, there is only one God. Satan is not an alternative God, mm -hmm. but there are absolutely two ways of doing things. One is the world and one is the kingdom. Uh, and so I think, what, what are we fighting against? Um, there are times when John's gospel creates the best climate. And what I find difficult, for example, about the Archbishop of Canterbury's sermon, the New Year sermon that he gave, is that it fits in very beautifully theologically with a kind of one world order and is utterly foreign to the concerns that, that John has in his gospel. So, for example, he, he, if I may read from it, he says, uh, he talks about the lovely experiment they're having in Lambeth Palace with lots of different people making up a community. And it is a lovely experiment. And I've heard many people talk, talk well of it. Um, but he says that uh, there's a parallel in this community to our country. We are wonderfully more diverse than we used to be. Wait a moment. Diversity is a code word for this particular progressive pro-immigration multiculturalism that has got nothing to do with the gospel, the kingdom of heaven, and everything to do with secular culture. Uh, so he flags up that that's one of his dominating uh, philosophical words. We're wonderfully more diverse than we used to be. We disagree on many things and are struggling how to disagree well. Hope lies not in Jesus, not in the kingdom, not in the church, not in the Holy Spirit. For well be it lies in our capacity to approach this new year in a spirit of openness to one another. Well, he's writing this in the most divided English political uh, and cultural situation that ever has been. We're not open to one another at all. Some people are struggling to preserve democracy by the skin of their teeth and other people are struggling to extinguish democracy because if you allow the people to make a choice, they make the wrong choices. The, the idea that hope lies in being open to each other is, I'm afraid, fatuous. Kevin, um, I mean, li living as I do uh, amidst the bucolic fields and meadows of Florida, what does Justin Mel Welby mean when he says the virtue, diversity is a virtue? Why is it a good thing? I don't understand that. 
because he is identifying with the Euro elite who have been pushing multiculturalism uh, and internationalism and, and immigration without borders uh, in order to produce a, a different kind of society. Why, why they like that, I, I really don't know. Does Melanie this Phillips, diversity apply to Christ or to, I mean, one can like Chinese food versus Italian food, but does this all the way go up the ladder to ethics and morals and to the revealed person of Jesus Christ? Where does it stop? The, the short answer is yes, it does go or it does apply to everything. And no, it doesn't stop. And that's why they've bought in to identity politics, to um, uh, to sexual incoherence and to rel relativism. And that's why hope lies in being nice to each other and not in Jesus and the conversion of the human soul. I see another antagonist in this protagonist. No, antagonist. Oh, I'm so tired. I don't know. An antagonistic protagonist. Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> I see tiredness. Now, in 2000, 2001, 2002, if we had posted a picture from the Diocese of Ni uh, Niagara where two men had been mailed, married by a uh, female priest, there would have been an outcry. I would have heard from primates around the world or their offices or their provinces putting together some type of letterhead and uh, um, letter saying this is wrong. And they would refer to the 39 articles. They would refer to the Windsor process. They would refer to all these things. We, the, the Anglican Church has become silent now. I don't hear GAFCON uh, uh, responding to this stuff. I don't hear primates responding. Uh, we have Albany telling... Uh, 815, we're not going to go along with this uh, uh, gay marriage, same-sex marriage in our diocese. And I, th the most I hear from 815 is, well, we're disappointed in you. No, they're not even willing to sue them or take them to court or uh, do some disciplinary stuff for Bishop Love. Anglicanism right now is tired. Ke uh, Kevin, you're completely right, and that one on a human level, mm -hmm. because what we've, you and I and, and Gavin have talked to these leaders of the international church, the GAFCON leaders and the Global South people, and and so many promises have been made by Rowan Williams, but especially Justin Welby, that were not kept. And if you're the head of a church in a difficult part of the world, whether you're facing uh, economic pressures, gr tremendous poverty, or uh, the assault of Islam, or the assault of uh, militant uh, secular uh, political leaders, and you go out on a limb to fight what you regard as almost a Western battle, and you think you have a, a, a binding determination, and then you learned otherwise, oh, well, sorry, uh, it's not, it doesn't mean what we thought it, you, you thought it mean. Why, why should the Ugandans, why should the Nigerians, why should the, China, uh, the Southeast Asian and Singapore get involved anymore when they've been burned so many times? Hmm? Well, the reason is because we're an apostolic church. Ke Kevin and I did a, a session a few days ago where the record button didn't work. And <laughs> in, in, <laughs> it, it, during that, uh, I said to Kevin, um, and it, it wasn't heard, but I'd like to say it again because I think it, it applies. I said that one of the reasons that I had moved from being um, uh, a friend of the new identity politics, a friend of the new sexual ethics, uh, and, and essentially someone who was as attractive to a Jungian account of the world as uh, a New Testament one, was because I had had two very vivid experiences. Uh, was was sort of of heaven but the other was certainly of hell my experience of hell came in 2008 it was very vivid and very real and the and, and satan and the demonic and the reality of hell have been with me ever since i can still smell the sulfur and feel the burning on my skin now the trouble is once you take heaven and hell seriously you're no longer doing religion you're, you're doing a, a, a passionate quest to get into the heart at the arms of the father and to, to shake off the appalling suction of evil into the nether regions. Now, now, once that's the case, that's where your energy comes from. It's about saving souls. Uh, that's, that's Christianity. You can do a kind of spirituality, a sort of religious gloss, 
with with um, you know where you mention Jesus and some of the nice things of the New Testament every so often to to allow you to feel you're leading a spiritual life. Uh, but one of the ways in which the new progressive culture identifies its roots is its fury with Christian values, with Christian ethics, with, with Christian names. Uh, and that's how we know that we really are in a struggle between good and evil. Um, I can well understand that some people uh, aren't engaged much in it and, it, and, and you know, they're, they're busy doing church and would like to say their prayers quite quietly. But Christianity has been driven by those who had a sense that human beings are caught between heaven and hell and we have to work very hard uh, in our journey to move from one towards the other. But, but Gavin, I appreciate what you're saying and uh, no, no one has ever called me a dualist. Uh, people have called me a pietist. Um, <laughs> That's nearly as rude. <laughs> Pious <Yeah>. platitudes. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> and, and perhaps my mindset is that uh, demography is destiny. I mean, let me just take a little hard demographic facts. There are five Episcopal churches in my county, and about 10 years ago, roughly they were all the same size, give or take 20 odd people here or there. Today, my parish is greater than the other four combined, and they're declining, we're expanding, they're not re reproducing, we're reproducing, and if the trends continue in 10 more years, we'll just be doing great and they'll have to fold. Um, and that's when I, so when I see these things coming out of Toronto, when I hear the latest silliness from the, from the Archbishop of Canterbury, from my parochial pietist perspective in the United States, market forces are at work and they're being driven out of business while the good successful brands and products of that one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church are alive and prospering because but, the other, I, but you tell me time and again that doesn't work in england well hold on a second but here's the difference all the other priests uh at those other parishes have the same situation you do you have a safe bishop they have a safe bishop so there's there's more than one difference here uh the difference uh clearly is you've developed the community of a church uh you worship god and there's there's the fruits are being applied um, it's not just the safe bishop that's making uh, this church grow. Gav, uh, Kevin, Orlando's about 100 miles away. It might as well be Miami, which is in Florida. <laughs> yeah. It's as far away as possible to be. Uh -huh. so. Well, uh, George, you're, you have a wonderful pithy praise say, saying demography is destiny. I'm sure that's true. And I respond by saying context is everything. So one, one of the moments when we nearly fell off our chairs laughing in the pre-show was when when you said, well, actually, what we're really doing is we are we're, we're reliving the dynamics of 1939, when the people of Europe said, uh, "Help! We are about to be overcome by a very nasty force." And the Americans said, uh, "We're fine over here. Don't bother us. Don't involve <laughs> us. We're doing very nicely. Thank you very much." Well. Um, in a, it's a different nasty force, or rather it's a different expression of the same nasty force. But in Europe, Christianity is holding on by the skin of its teeth, where we are, we are fighting very hard. You cannot hold public office if you are a Christian. So, um, you know, the, the leader of the Liberal Democrats was thrown out because he had Christian views on ethics. Um, the number of people in public office who are not allowed to express their views and remain Christian grows all the time. I'm really very pleased that you you are safe and flourishing in Florida and it's a wonderful sign of God's goodness and I I, 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 I thank God and I respect you. However, the task we're facing in England and in Europe is, is a rather more pressured one. And we're also seeing that in, you know, in different parts of the United States. There was a recent where two senators, uh, Kamala Harris of California and Maisie something from Hawaii, attacked a nominee to the bench because he was a member of the Knights of Columbus. As uh, if absolutely. This yeah. as, the, as, this, as if being a member of the Knights of Columbus. Now, the Columbus Hall is just across the street from us, so if they're doing satanic rituals, I'd like to know about it. Now, this know. is the weather then. They, they, they came for the Catholics and I did nothing. They'll come for you at some later stage. <laughs> um, th th this, this is exactly so. The, the faith, faithful Catholics in public office in America are now being picked upon because, particularly because of their views on abortion. That's where they break surface sure. and can be seen. Well, and here, may, I, may I just uh, 
there was a nominee for a federal magistrate, uh, which is a still a federal judge, but it's the the entry level, who is an ACNA, is a member, I think, the Falls Church, and uh, Sheldon Whitehorse, the uh, senator, Democratic senator from Rhode Island, attacked this man for being a member of the ACNA. Therefore, you must be a homophobe and a bigot and anti anti choice. Well, and we have uh, we'll, we at, at the time. The, these two senators attacking the Knights of Columbus and this fellow attacking the member of the ACNA, essentially that resulted in condemnation of them for being religious, anti-religious bigots. It didn't have any traction. Yeah, but, but, but it will do. The, 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 progressive, the, the progressive political, and we would call it theological, agenda that has progressed so much farther in Europe now means that when they do this, they get away with it. So we have a, a, a judge who simply told the truth in, an, in a very low-key way that he thought that, that, that the evidence was it was better for children to grow up with a mother and a father. And, for, and he happens to be a Christian, but, but that was all he said. And he was thrown off the bench. He was thrown off adoption cases for, for, for saying her, secular heresy. Um, we now live in an area where you, in a context where you cannot say Christian things and hold public office. And increasingly, as people make signs of witness on the social media, um, they get excluded from, from social media at the same time. So the, the things are, what, what is gonna happen in 2019? The theological, political and spiritual fight is going to become more intense. But Gavin, I have set up my computer for Anglican Inc. Anytime a member of the House of Bishops speaks to rise in the House of Lords <laughs> and Hansard records their words, I get that tent to me. And every day I get four or five during the sittings, times where bishops get up and speak on the important, vital, political issues of the day. Whether they have... <laughs> Gavin, why are they not speaking about this judge? Why are they not speaking about a CBD? Oh, why are bishops, the bishops geez. of the Church of England having a wonderful time talking about slot machines, but nothing to say about these moral issues that you're you're speaking of? Well, be be because we go back to the original diagnosis, there are two kinds of Anglicanism. One has given way to the prevailing culture in order to. Uh, make its life as comfortable as possible. I understand why they've done that. I just think they're profoundly wrong and they're being disobedient to our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and the other form of Anglicanism and faithful Christianity in the country won't do that. Uh, it's just a matter of how you see fidelity to Jesus or you know, going back to what it is to be a member of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church uh, under the authority of the New Testament. I, okay, Kevin, it's so frightening, okay, for what you're saying because you you hit, you were absolutely right about American complacency. If I'm okay, I'm assume you're just having a bad day. But overall, things are fine. And I must to admit to having that mindset in the back of me. And if you talk about change, and you say change, the Church of England is the bishops have lost touch. The ch the church is just fallen and corrupt and failing in every way, get out. People imagine having to go to some church with a man wearing a plaid shirt, one of these little beards like this and say, I can't, <laughs> I can't be in an AMIE. I mean, I can't, I, I need my church back. Where do I go to get my church back? And the Roman Catholics are just as bad. I mean, what well, does a, what is a faithful English man or woman do in this situation? Oh, George, this is a sixty-four thousand dollar question. If I can be American for a moment, well, though, why it's not sixty-four thousand no, no, pounds? Now the clock will start million. Million. So you've got sixty-four thousand pounds. Go ahead. Sixty-four thousand pounds is more valuable. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I wish I knew. Uh, I get emails frequently from people saying, "I've come to the end of what I can cope with from the Church of England. What do I do?" Uh, and the answer is we don't know we're fine to find as we go along i think that in the we have something like seven good years rather like pharaoh's dream during which we can we can create for what i think is going to be a catacomb church that is coming um i think we will have to grow underground uh, I, I think for example that churches will be able to exist above ground so long as they don't offend in terms of secular ethics and just like the early church teaching about the eucharist uh, it will say catechumens out. Only if you really uh, understand the mystery of faith can you continue. Um, so I think we have, we're preparing for a church that will go 
half underground. The mantra, Kevin will back me up on this. The mantra in the uh, early 15 years ago from the Episcopal Church was pray, stay, and pay. Mm. And it will all be fine. And the words of the ACNA and people were, we'll pray all right, but we're not staying and we're not paying. Mm -hmm. If you're a parishioner in the Church of England, um, we call, of course, for upon you to pray, but do you stay? Do you pay? I mean, come on, we need some pithy sound bites from you, Gavin, to solve these people's problems. Well, this it's, is, it's it's apart from moving from Florida, which is what I'm proposing, there's not much we can offer people, is there? Well, we've run it's up a, against 34 minutes. Okay. So move to Florida. I think that's... Yeah, move to Florida is not, not the answer. But, you know, we, we did bring up a, a great point here. Audience participation, what can you do? You don't just have to sit and watch programs uh, to be a participant in this. We are part of a kingdom. And praying is, it is a solution to the problem. Um, because you're praying that God's will will be done. And, you know, it sounds trite. It sounds, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to work. Um, it's the only thing that's ever worked uh, in the history of mankind. And I think we want to offer encouragement you know, we have an undefined uh, denomination. We uh, Anglicanism is undefined. Culture is undefined. 2019 can be a very scary, scary place, depending on your demography. Uh, it's probably going to be that scary in Florida. Uh, here in Connecticut, it's obviously going to be scary. Over in, uh, we, have we Brexited yet, England? Um, I, I can't imagine what you're going through with the stress. Every Monday morning, uh, the papers go, you know, Theresa May is out, she's out, she's out. Tuesday morning, well, she's still in, she's still, in, you know. It's, you know, this dichotomy of worry, uh, stress that, that is pushed upon us. And we're called by Scripture to be anxious in nothing. And God has thrown up some people in England right now, one of whom is on our show. Who her voice is crying out now there are some very brave people who are crying out mm -hmm. and uh, and it's it's exciting to see that they it's encouraging to see that they have the same what i think is the mind of christ in other words um the the, the danger of people like me is to, to 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 fear that our rather eccentric psychological profile has expressed itself theologically and this is just a sign of one's own mental distress the fact that a number of us share the same views is very encouraging. I think in answer to your question earlier on, since we're banging up against time, I think we're going to be forming apostolic house churches, much as they have done in China. We will have to go under the radar and find ourselves faithful uh, because I'm an Episcopalian, Episcopally led uh, sacramental and Bible studying house groups who will keep the kingdom of heaven going. We are just called to be faithful. The rest is up to God. We just need to keep the faith as he has shown it to us um, and as we understand our relationship with him. And if we do it in, a, in underground, in the catacombs, in a repressive society, well, that's fine. If you do it in a green and pleasant democratic land where you have more resources, God bless you. Well, we see this at work right now, Gavin, in Iran. We see mm. this in Algeria. We see this in China. We see this in Muslim majority countries where the church, we've had uh, Father Argo uh, one of mm. our uh, semi-regulars who's a missionary in a predominantly Muslim country, uh, telling us that the church is bursting its banks with uh, former Muslims, uh, former atheists coming to Jesus Christ. And if it can happen in Iran, it can happen in China, it can, and, if, and if it's happening in Florida, there's no reason why it can't happen in England. We it's have to just, keep faith. <laughs> <laughs> we do. He, he, I even saw a poll that said uh, that the churches within England, I don't know if it's Church of England, uh, saw more attendance. I mean, obviously, uh, the people are there and they want to believe. Let's give them something to believe in. Guys, it's been a wonderful show. I know we could talk for hours and hours, but geez, it's the first day of the year. We need to go and do some stuff. And I need to get my second cup of coffee going or we're not going to make it. Guys, uh, wonderful year. Let's do a little audience participation. You just sat through 35 minutes of your favorite people talking about your favorite topic. If you liked it, and I know you did, click the like button, either on Facebook or YouTube. Um, share. A lot of you aren't sharing. 
you know, we get, you know, 2,000 viewers per episode. <laughs> 2,000 people should be sharing, or you're afraid to admit you watch the program. Comment. I, we just did our episode with the, uh, the Toronto, Toronto, the uh, Niagara Falls uh, gay wedding. Lots of comments. We like that. There should be lots of comments here. If you want to comment on how you define Anglicanism or the problems you see within Anglicanism, this is a great time to do it. We will answer comments. Subscribe and if, if you've you not... would like information about real estate and beautiful flowers. <laughs> That's <Florida>. right. <laughs> well, you moved to a golf course. George didn't tell you this, but when he moved, he moved to a golf course. So he's he's sitting pretty fine on some Next nice real estate. to a golf course. And one of the things <laughs> I discovered this morning, our first overnight in the new home, hmm? is they cut the grass at 5 a.m. Oh. The giant <laughs> tractors come out with the headlights on because the courses are packed from dawn to dusk. And now, so they do it in the middle of the night. All the golfers are smiling when they hear they hear that sound how about george <laughs> so if you want to subscribe please subscribe to the show and we have a podcast if you want to click on the show notes you'll see a link to the podcast and you can listen to the show on podcast i'm kevin colson i'm george conger i'm gavin ashenden you've been listening to episode 468 of anglican unscripted on the 1st of january 2018 19 19. <laughs> you have one job. One job. One job. <laughs>